attendance in memoriam. Thank you, and uh, good evening, everyone. I believe uh, the mayor uh, would like to recognize the yeah, passing yeah. of. Well, yeah. uh, oh, you, okay. We have four memoriams tonight uh, relative to uh, former Quincy Public School employees. The first is Genevieve Bertoni. She was a Quincy Public School secretary for 20 years at the former Pollard School and in the curriculum office and was later at Quincy Junior College as the secretary to the Dean of Academic Affairs, the vice president and president. Next, we have Patricia Cottarelli, Pat Cottarelli, central registration administrative nurse for 18 years. She'll be greatly missed. Uh, next is Warren Lewis, a teacher at uh, one of my teachers at Massfield School, was a teacher for 40 years at Massfields, Montclair, and Squanum Elementary Schools, and also served as Squanum's assistant principal, an excellent teacher. And similarly, uh, Pamela Mateo, an excellent teacher and administrator, was a teacher and administrator for 23 years, first a Spanish and French teacher at North Quincy High School and later assistant principal at Broad Meadows and North Quincy High School. If you could keep these individuals and their families in your thoughts and prayers, and I know that the mayor would like to also recognize the passing of Chief Gorman. Yeah, I, I might. Uh, the public doesn't necessarily see the interaction between departments, uh, but there's certainly a lot of interaction between departments, and one of which is the fire department. And uh, Chief Gorman was uh, the head of the fire department for a lot of years, as was his father. He also serves as Director of Emergency Management. Uh, loved the job, loved the city. Uh, so we offer our uh, sympathy to his wife, Sally, and his, his children. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, we have an opportunity for community input regarding the Quincy Public Schools. Community in this context is defined as a resident of the city of Quincy, a non-resident parent of a student who attends the Quincy Public Schools, or a non-resident employee of the Quincy Public Schools. After giving his or her name and address, each speaker may make a, res a presentation of no more than three minutes to the school committee. An individual may not exchange their time or yield to others. Residents or non-community persons may submit written statements of up to 300 words to the school committee at QSC Open Forum at quincypublicschools.com by 4 p.m. of the day prior to the posted school committee regular meeting. Written statements will be posted on the school committee section of the Quincy Public Schools website by noon on the day of the posted school committee regular meeting. Is there anyone here who would like to speak at Open Forum? Okay, so we'll move on. Thank you. Um, superintendent's report. Thank you. Good evening again. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, first item on the agenda is a uh, school committee member recognition. Uh, congratulations to Mrs. Emily Lebo for being recognized with a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Massachusetts Association of School Committees Board of Directors in honor of her contributions to the children of the Quincy Public Schools. Mrs. Lebo's career with the Quincy Public Schools began in 1985 with her appointment as a substitute school nurse before becoming an instructor in the health assistant program, then became the director of occupational education at the Quincy Vocational Technical School, and later was appointed director of career and technical education at Quincy High School. Mrs. Lebo is now in her 13th year as a Quincy School Committee member and has served a term as vice chair as well as being a founding member and chair of the teaching and learning subcommittee. The award will be presented at a dinner on November 8th during the MASK conference in Hyannis. Please join me in congratulating Mrs. Levo on this great recognition. Congratulations. Do you want to say anything? No. I just want to say that um, I had a uh, a great 22 or so years working for the district. And uh, when I left, I missed it so much, I decided to run for school committee because I just love the place that much. And, um, and I've been so blessed to be able to serve on this committee for as long as I have. So I want to thank the constituents out there as well as all the uh, administrators that I've worked with and for, and um, the SLT and the superintendent's team for everything that they've done to support the school committee. 
Thank you. And the mayor, of course. Thank you. Next is the backpack and school supply distribution. Over 3,000 backpacks filled with school supplies were recently delivered across the city to students in kindergarten through grade five. As you know, distribution events were held on Thursday, September 5th. And thank you, of course, to our school committee members who were able to attend, as well as all of the SLT members and principals for their assistance in distributing these backpacks. Special thanks to our dedicated business partners, including Blue Clark, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, Cradles to Crayons, Granite Telecommunications, Mass Bay Credit Union, and Quincy Credit Union for once again supporting the Backpack and School Supply Initiative. And I can't speak highly enough of our business partners and how they step, out, step up every year to help our students and our staff with this great initiative. <clears throat> Thank you again to the school committee for attending. <clears throat> Next is by the end of September, Quincy Public Schools will be completing Initial fire and safety drills at all of our schools. This includes lockdown drills as well. Throughout the school year, there will be an additional, there'll be additional fire and lockdown drills at each school site scheduled. And I want to give a special thanks to the Transportation Security Director, Michael Drakeo, and his team, and of course the Quincy Police and Fire Departments for their assistance with these important safety measures for students and staff. Sure. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Superintendent. I just, um, I had also seen in the, uh, the ledger this weekend that there was an article about the um, active shooter drills that the police and fire are doing sort of on behalf of to prepare for any kind of situation mm -hmm. uh, if one were ever to come up in Quincy on the schools. So I'm wondering if maybe we could invite Mike Drakeo to come to an upcoming meeting to just kind of talk about any updates that we've had or any, you know, how they're doing that. It detailed in the article pretty specifically what they were working on. But I thought it might be a good idea to invite him to kind of talk to the public about what those drills might look like, and if any, if the teachers are being brought into that to mm -hmm. understand what would happen in those situations. Sure, we um, can certainly have Mr. Drake do that. We may want to consider doing that in executive session in order to, and that not necessarily reveal uh, the procedures that would be followed for okay. these types of things, just for the safety of students and staff. Okay, I just um, more meant in general, like what was presented in the article. Mm -hmm. um, which I is haven't read the article, okay. but I'll, yeah. I'll take a look at yeah. it. But I, I definitely want to be careful about okay. not revealing too much information to potential people okay. who may use it for nefarious Yeah, I just purposes. had a bunch of questions on it, and I thought maybe it wasn't appropriate in this meeting because mm -hmm. it's not officially on the agenda, but just where it was a tie-in yeah. with those safety drills. Um, sure. That would be great to have him Yep, and the us. Quincy police and the fire work very closely with us in um, we can review with you uh, in detail what they've done um, over the last couple of years to become more acquainted with the schools in the event that there is an emergency that they need to respond to, and this is part of that. Mm -hmm. um, again, the specific details of what they do and what they planned are geared towards, obviously, uh, making sure that our students and staff are safe during these, you know, during these dangerous events. So. We can certainly put something together so that uh, you know what the updates are, but certainly teachers and staff are always included in the lockdown drills as well, because that's the whole purpose of having a lockdown drill is to train and to practice in the event of a serious situation at one of our schools. Mm. But we'll be happy to put a presentation together for you. Yeah, and they're aware of what would happen. So I know they know the lockdown end of it, but they're aware of what would, what happens on the outside of the, their classroom door, right? Like what police and fire are being trained to do. Yeah, we, act, we okay. go through, uh, during okay. a lockdown drill, the entire lockdown drill process is, is actually performed as if it's a, a live okay. lockdown. Okay, thank but you. But we can review that with That'd you. That'd be great, thanks. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I can jump in on that, just, just a little back, background on it for those that didn't see the paper. So uh, the city applied for and received a grant through the OASI grant, which is Homeland Security Monies. Uh, and we hired an outside company uh, that specializes in all of this to bring the police, fire, and we involved the EMS from Booster Ambulance. Uh, we've seen a lot of things happen around the country over the years, and, um, you know, thank God nothing's happened here. And we hope for the best, but you have to plan. And uh, in some cases around the country, public safety officials failed. And there wasn't enough planning. There wasn't enough training. So this is a very intense program for both police and fire, who does what, who's responsible for what, uh, when to fire, go in, uh, et cetera, et cetera, command center posts, all, all aspects of it. And it's not just the schools, because we've seen 
mass shootings in public squares, other spaces, so it's, uh, it certainly includes the schools. I think at some point it'd be fine to invite both chiefs to come before us, just to give a little bit of a, an update on it. Um, and I gotta say, both departments are always training, um, so we're very proud of, of the professionalism, both Chief Kenny and Chief Jackson uh, uh, and the departments are performing so well. But, but it was a grand program, the, the training portion, official training, portion is finished, there'll be ongoing training over time. And, it, and I think it's fair to note, and everybody knows this, I would think that police and fire in our schools on a regular basis. They know the buildings, they know the rooms, they know the niches, they know the basement, they know the boiler room. Uh, it's part of the training, uh, just like a lot of other facilities in the city that aren't under our jurisdiction. But uh, we're on top of things, and uh, I'm grateful to both chiefs for leading this effort. So at some point, I think it would be Mike, Mike and sure. to have them in to say what they can say in public. Of course. Thank you. And we've done that in the past as well, so that's a great idea. Yeah, I, I just wa wanted to add on to that. I know, uh, Mayor, we had talked about putting the safety audit into an exec executive session. Um, I don't know if that's too old now to look at, but I think it's still something that's valuable for us to take a look at and see where we are. I know, and I agree that I some. Agree that. We, sh we should up we'll get an update from the company we did this year. It's separate from this. But right, it's, right, it's, and just uh, take a look at that again. Um, but I think a lot of stuff has to stay in executive session because we don't want to be showing your cards. I mean, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And next is the um, Quincy Public Schools Music Department recently completed two successful weeks of instrument demonstration for our students. Grades four and five students saw demonstrations of woodwind instruments, and grades two. Uh, uh, students were introduced to stringed in instruments. Amazingly, over 250 students expressed interest in joining the elementary school band program and received the rental instruments this past Monday night. Next Monday, students who are interested in playing a string, string instrument in our after-school string lesson program will receive theirs. Band lessons have begun for grades four and five students at uh, school, and the after-school strings program is scheduled to begin the week of October 15th. Uh, and so, of course, thank you to our music department for everything they do to encourage our students to participate in band in all aspects of it. Next is for the upcoming November 5th Professional Development Day for QPS educators. Over 80 different small group sessions are available for 950 professional staff members to choose from with topics ranging from literacy, STEM, English learner, and special education supports to integrating music and movement, educator wellness, and restorative practices. We are looking forward to the special day for the Quincy Public Schools professional staff members, and special thanks, of course, to Dr. Perkins and the superintendent's leadership team for organizing this great event. Last year was very successful, and we're hoping to have another successful uh, day on November 5th. So thank you everyone who helped put that together. And lastly, the City of Quincy is hosting the annual Food Truck and Music Festival on Saturday, October 5th from noon to 6 p.m. along Coddington Street with entertainment for families on the lawn of the Thomas Crane Library and the four bands on the main stage in the Coddington Building parking lot. So with that, that ends the Superintendent's report. Mayor Coke. If I can jump in on that portion sure. of it. Um, uh, we're, the word is getting out a little bit, but on November the 9th, we're going to be dedicating the newest monument at Mount Wallace in the veterans section. And we are putting a call out for all veterans, either from Quincy or who now live in Quincy, that served in the military during the Persian Gulf, Desert Storm, Iraq, Afghanistan, or commonly known as the Global War on Terror. Uh, we have a number of folks that have already signed up, so we're inviting people to participate, to reach out to the Veterans Services Department or the Mayor's Office, uh, and uh, we get uh, big plans for that day. Uh, those veterans will be parading to Mount Wallaston, led by our Quincy High, North Quincy High Band, of course. Uh, we have some distinguished speakers. Uh, some of you uh, may not be aware, but there's this actually a row, which starts at the Civil War, a uh, monument to each of the conflicts and wars right up to Vietnam, and this would be the, the latest. And uh, it's, it's that era, it's time that we recognize this era of veterans. So, Again, if you're from Quincy or if you moved away from Quincy, you're still eligible. Or if you live in Quincy now and served, would love to have your name, address, and reach out to you directly to get an invitation out. But we'll, we'll let you all know more details later. When is it again? November 9th, Saturday. Saturday at Mount Wallaston, 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. Okay. Um, yes. 
I'm sorry I didn't say this sooner, but I just wanted to say that the back, backpack event, having been in two of the schools the first week of opening, and the condition of those schools was amazing. I just want to thank the custodial staff and the city people who have been working on our buildings because it was really, everything was shining. And the kids were shining and the teachers were shining and it was just a joy to be there. Thank so you. thank you to the custodians. Thank you. Next on the agenda, old business is none. And new business, we have student support services program improvement plan by Ms. McGill. Good evening. Um, good evening, Mayor Koch, Superintendent Mulvey, and Chairperson Ms. Cahill, and school committee members. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share my program improvement plan. Um, there you go. Is, oh, sorry. Better? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so um, I really appreciate this opportunity to share with you. Um, I believe the Quincy Public Schools remains steadfast in its commitment to supporting academic social, emotional, and mental health wellness of all students. Our comprehensive vision for um, really centers around the implementation of tiered interventions designed to bolster students' academic progress while nurturing their social and emotional development. Through these efforts, we aim to create a robust support system that promotes the well-being for our students and their families. We're proud to highlight our strategic partnership with esteemed organizations which play a critical role in strengthening the network of resources available to our students and families. These um, collaborations enable us to expand the scope and support and offer a more targeted interventions to meet the diverse needs of students. Before we do dive into the details of our new goals for the academic year, um, for 2024 and 2025, I'd like to offer a reflection on the progress made last year towards last year's goals, celebrating the achievements of and learning from the challenges. Beginning on page seven, for a goal reflection, the student support team again collected and analyzed um, information and data related to high risk reports. This is an indicator of how many students struggle with their mental health and require a referral to Aspire. There was a drop of about 25, 25 referrals. There were 196 referrals to the crisis team in 22-23, and in 23-24, there were 171 referrals. Walker Therapeutic Clinicians were based in the majority of the sites, which allowed 80 student, over 80 students to receive school-based counseling. We believe that this may have contributed to the decrease in the crisis referrals. Moving forward, we've partnered with Aspire Health Alliance to have a clinician at both North Quincy and Quincy High School to provide crisis intervention, short-term behavioral health care, and referrals. And this is absolutely free to Quincy Public Schools. Aspire wrote a grant for us and partnered with us. I'm really, really grateful for that opportunity. She's already done some great work this year. The SEL initiative on page eight through open parachute and restorative practices was a great success. Educators and student support staff have fully implemented these practices, but of course there is more work to be done. Last year, new student support staff, deans and educators were trained in restorative practices. This year through professional development, we're providing support through a book discussion with Dr. Haley Watson Staff signing up for this professional development get, will get a copy of the book, Finding the Words, and engage in guided discussions. And that's a real support for them to implement the, the platform. On page nine, supervisors of attendance, um, again, assisted students and families in monitoring home visits in collaboration with site staff and agencies to mitigate barriers to regular attendance and school success. The Appendix F includes the number of, att of attendance hearings in and you'll see like an increase for the attendance hearing. So that's the site-based hearing. That's like the very first meeting that we have. Um, and the number of CRAs, which are the actual court petitions, they decreased. We feel that the earlier intervention of attendance hearings may have made positive impact. Um, the supervisors of attendance continue to work to ensure that students who did not live in the city of Quincy attend public schools. You can see the many, many residency checks that have occurred throughout the past school year already 
underway this year again. So there were 614 residency checks um, that were done in seven, that, that required 757 visits. The Homeless Liaison has worked extremely closely with sites to ensure students who experience homelessness do not have a disruption in their education. She is also very active um, within the community to help families with resources that, that they need. She's really outstanding. There was a significant increase in high school students experience, experiencing homelessness. And that is why I like programs like Schools on Wheels um, and the prom donations and things like that are vital. So she has really um, crafted a number of um, strategic partners to help those kids. The goals for 24 and 25 begin on page 12. Student support teams will continue to gather high-risk data. And this year, again, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey will be implemented on October 22nd. One of the important measures for the new implementation of a behavioral health navigator will be to collect data around how many referrals that, that are made to, to the navigator and the outcome of the referral. More information on the behavioral health navigator can be found in the appendix. Last year, I was able to write a grant um, through Beth Israel Leahy Health for a behavioral health navigator. We're excited to report that we're awarded $300,000 through that grant which means that the Behavioral Health Navigator will be funded for three years. This academic year is year one. The Behavioral Health Navigator will assist students and families throughout the district that need mental health care. As you can imagine, navigating the mental health system is overwhelming. So we expect that more and more families will be able to access the care that they need through this grant opportunity. We are perfectly poised to assist those families that have the most barriers. We are so very grateful to Beth Israel, another amazing partner. The second goal um, is to create professional development plan for SEL and the implementation of the Sandy Hook Promise Program grades 6 through 12 in Walker Solutions Professional Development Trauma-Informed Classrooms. Also this year, we've created a QPS Coalition for Student Mental Health and Wellness to strengthen the network of outstanding partner agencies that provide professional development, counseling, mentoring, substance use treatment. We've had two meetings thus far, and in Appendix F, you can find the agendas for those meetings. The third goal is to implement programming to support hygiene security and Big Brother, Big Sister, Big Future program to mitigate the barriers to good attendance. Mentoring and hygiene security are two specific strategies to support students with good attendance and academic success. We've already made significant progress in this area and you can refer to Appendix G for more information and update on those initiatives. On page 13, continued goals. The goals this year are specific to the new programming and networking that is in this comprehensive plan. The Sandy Hook Promise student training, which includes whole body training grades um, throughout the district, so grades 6 through 12. So it's all staff and all kids, which is pretty amazing, and it's free. And that's through the Attorney General's office. And so there are two training sessions for the whole student body, starting with hello to combat um, student isolation and say something. So um, I really feel like that's an important part of school safety, to see something say something, um, to train everybody to use the same language. So I'm really excited about that opportunity. And already, all the middle schools and the high schools participated in a welcome meeting um, this past week and this week. The student support staff will continue to support Open Parachute SEL platform specifically to address stigma around mental health and to really get those parent resources out there. The student support staff will continue to participate in the NAN project, suicide prevention, and trauma-informed classrooms, professional development, and student offerings. The high school student support staff will work with Aspire Clinician to ensure that students receive crisis intervention, that short-term counseling, and referrals. The middle and high school student support staff will participate in the nicotine vaping cessation professional development so that sites can provide support for those students struggling with healthy decisions and dependence. The goals for the supervisors of attendance begin on page 22, and on page 24, you'll find the goals for the homeless liaison. The goals for the supervisors of attendance and the homeless liaison will remain the same. Residency and chronic absenteeism are the focus for the supervisors of attendance and for the homeless liaison. Um, it will, you know, she will provide staff, um, families, and students resources and supports, as well as coordinating community with community organizations. And that concludes my pre presentation, and I'll be glad to take some questions. Do you have any?
I'm only kidding. Uh, thank you very much, Mara. This was incredible reading. Um, it really is a, an incredible group of people who will be working with our kids. I just wanted to make sure that we haven't dropped the ball on Doug. I don't see them in there anywhere, but I know that they've been doing a lot of this already. I'm hoping that they'll be part of that coalition. Oh, them. yeah. Actually, they just they sent me um, a presentation, um, you know, some slides about what they did over the summer. And, um, you know, we, we, they're definitely a vital part. They just weren't new mm -hmm. this year, so I just didn't include them in the goals. Yeah, but they're excellent. Yeah, they're great partners. Uh, and I have another question. So the, the Sandy Hook Promise is amazing, and the three phases of that are amazing. Uh, I think it's going to be wonderful to see, and I agree that the common language is going to be great, but I really love the way they sat, sat with Laurel. I think that's a great program. It seems like a great program. And I was thrilled when I was reading the Trauma and Farm stuff from Waka that that wasn't a one-off, that they kind of come back yes. and work with the teachers after they've given them some help and some, some ideas of what to do. That was a pretty intensive looking professional development as well. Yes. Um, I had a question about the Big Brothers Big Sisters. Who are the bigs going to be? I'm sorry? Who are the bigs going to be? And the big brother, big sister. Okay, so they're focusing on grade nine at Quincy High School. So no, they're, the they're doing their there. recruitment. So they, they're recruiting from the community. Okay, so it's not teachers necessarily. No, teachers, that's a little tricky. Teachers can't really have a dual relationship with students. It gets a little tricky. So um, it could be teachers from an elementary school that maybe would want to um, mentor, but they can't have the child in their class and be right. a big. Right. I think that so would be somebody from outside the school that will be doing the mentoring. Yes, yeah. They reaching out to like alumni or college, they call, you know, like Curry or yes. Curry College and seeing. Yep. So um, actually, Laura helped um, big, the Big Brother Big Sister um, Association reach out to alum um, through you know, like class lists of older, so like you know, late twenties and beyond. Um, and also they've um, worked with a lot of our partners already. So Keith Sagala has worked with them. We meet with them monthly and they're part of that um, QPS coalition. Um, and so they've been keeping us updated in the appendix. You'll see that 65 kids already signed up. Um, yeah, and so they've, they have recruited, like at, the, at that time they had 30 bigs, but they're really hopeful that they're gonna be able to meet the need and they wanna expand. So every year, they're going to expand, and they're going to include North Quincy High School, too. That's great. It's a great program. We've seen great, th great things happen with it. So it's an amazing amount of support between Walker and Aspire and, and the Northeastern and was it UMass Boston and Northeastern, the Beacon Grant, and having interns in, yep. too. So th th I assume there are people who are training to be psycho school psychologists and stuff that are becoming in as interns. Right, and school counselors, school counselors. Um, and school adjustment counselors. So they actually, they, the school adjustment counselors are also mental health and school adjustment. It's like a combined program. So we have um, three um, students and then um, that are doing school counseling, and then we have one school psychologist through Beacon. Northeastern will start next year. Okay, it looks great. It really is. It's a whole lot of stuff, but uh, it's amazing, the supports, and just the kind of funding that we're getting to do this stuff. and. The partners that are stepping up and we're yeah. not paying for a whole lot of it for no. a while anyway. So I know it's really the amazing people. I'm really grateful. I, and in some of it, I can absolutely see what the evaluation will be. We'll be able to see some numbers change. But I'm wondering if you have built, or if the coalition will build an evaluation system so we can see how all this worked out. Yeah, yeah, and you know, we set goals. Um, if you look at the agendas from our meetings, we set our own goals as a coalition. And one of them was to create a resource guide. So, so yeah. yeah, so I think that will be really helpful just so they'll know, like, maybe you can't get school-based counseling from one agency, but another agency might be doing home-based counseling, and there might be openings there. So just to kind of know what each agency can bring and what the waiting lists are like and what insurances they take, it's just going to really help. And um, Manit Health um, did say that they're going to train the behavioral health navigator for us for, for nothing. So they're just wonderful partners also. So just good people. That's an, that's an incredible position. I've, I, I did some reading on it, and it's an incredible position. Yeah. Really, I think some of the sites, when you go out there, nobody knows how to access the stuff. And some of the stuff isn't even real. But if you have a navigator who can walk you through it, yeah. it great. Yeah, so, really great. A lot of really good stuff. It's going to be a busy year. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a comment and three quick questions. First of all, congratulations on the behavioral health, 
behavioral health grant. That's oh, thank fantastic you. Thank you. That, uh, three three year grant. You said right. Yes. Yep. On the uh, high risk attendance, the early intervention part. Um, could you just say again what the metrics were in terms of how impactful it was last year and the, and the continuation this year? So um, we worked really, the supervisors of attendance worked really hard to meet kids um, and families a little earlier when they started to, you know, have some, uh, you know, unexcused absences. So really kind of working with the families early on with, you know, the principal and the counselor, they would have a meeting. And so those are the attendance hearings. Um, so they would just kind of offer support. Maybe they became aware of a medical issue. Maybe there was some anxiety. That was um, in the last school year. Right? That was, yeah, that was last and, school and year. did you see the numbers drop because of those? We saw the number of what we call, um, you know, the CRA petition. So we didn't have to take legal, we didn't have to file a legal, you know, petition because um, if there's less, you know, petitions, that means that kids were doing better so that, you know, we didn't have to file that. We don't love to file the mm -hmm. CRAs. We're mandated by law at some point yeah. um, to do that if there's not improvement. Um, so I th I took that as a really good sign. Um, and then w you you indicated uh, on the McKinney event that the, the homeless students, to, their federal grants are no longer available. What? When did that happen? Is that recent phenomena? I'm sorry. Say that again. I, I I thought I read that federal grants were no longer available. You said. Um, well, there has been, for the McKinney-Vento um, position, they have decreased the amount that they allocate towards um, towards that position, the McKinney-Vento grant itself, to pay for the liaison. So that's an issue. Yeah. I, I mean, the language that you had in the goal said federal programs, the, the loss of federal programs will likely result in more homeless families. So which, which programs? Well, that, well, so the you know, the recovery funding and things like that, that uh -oh. people, you know, that th they, they don't COVID have. COVID related. Yeah, related. yeah. So uh, people right. are losing, you know, money that way. And for some reason, the number of high school students that are homeless has really, you know, increased. Yeah. Which is really tough. Do, do you know the numbers from last year to this year? Those yeah, it's in the appendix. Um I know my appendix is uh, okay. kind of big, so <laughs> no, hang on, I'm sorry, I can tell you. So it's appendix B, and so it's just like a chart. I don't know if you have it there. I do. So okay. Great. But what was it last year? What's it this year right now at the moment? I mean, I, I know it's a snapshot in time, but. So the, the um, I. So actually, I don't have the numbers for this year. So I just have last year's numbers. Got it. And and how do they compare to the year before? Um. Sorry, I say it in my pep. Um. So there was. I think it's like there was an increase. Sorry, I have to go to the reflections. Yeah. So it went up to 209, and I believe the year before it was like 170. Mm. Got it. And then uh, la last question. What, what, if any, percentage of these programs are subsidized by ESSER funds? And does, it, does that lapse at the end of the school year or, or any? No, no ESSER funds. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. I was actually just going to say thank you so much for putting that in there. You know I'm going to ask every year for that, so <laughs> it saves me no the problem. time of asking, so thank you. I appreciate You're that. You're welcome. Um, this was a fabulous report. Um, I know you do actually so much more than this, so 
this is this is amazing though. This Thank is really you. really great. Um, and we had a really great presentation on the Hope and Comfort program. I was wondering if you had any update on how that's going right now. Yep. Kind of yeah, so we did, um, like over the summer, um, we worked with the Youth Works program. So we had high school kids help us pack the kits, which was really fun and really sweet. Um, and we delivered th those kits to the middle school, the three middle schools that are participating in the program. So it's Southwest, Broad Meadows, and Point Webster. And Snug Harbors continued to get products. Um, so where, you know, there'll be other deliveries, we'll have packing events so that's another I worked with the um, community service coordinators too to give high school kids the opportunity to participate in that I think those kids will want to come back and do it again they really enjoyed doing that and I was really appreciative of their help it's a lot of stuff <laughs> have we gotten any feedback from families on on the program at all have well snack harbor did do a survey last year and they were really appreciative of the products you know, there were a few people that said, because we did the whole school last year, that said, you know, thank you, but I don't need the products. Um, but most people really appreciate it because the price of groceries and things like that. And, um, you know, everybody was happy to receive it. There was no, like, stigma around it. I, You know, we didn't get that sense that, um, you know, people, you know, didn't want it. It's just that they didn't want to take if other people needed stuff. So um, the feedback was fantastic, and they actually liked the products. Thank yeah. you so much. This Thank was you. Wonderful. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, tons and tons of work to put this together and run these programs, and they're all so great um, to have available for our kids, uh, especially the mental health stuff that, you know, since COVID we've seen increase. And I, it's maybe the first time I've heard you say that there's been a decrease in referrals, and that's fantastic. Yeah. And I hope that that's because of all the, the things we have in place that are they're helping. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so I have a couple questions. One, um, I'm just going to ask first because uh, Mrs. Hubley brought up the uh, the Hope and Comfort program. I actually had a student reach out from uh, one of the Girl Scout troops, uh, and one of their projects they're they're looking to try to get hygiene products in all of the um, the restrooms in in the, all the schools um, to just have some hygiene products in there, and they're just looking for some help okay. uh, in how to coordinate that um, or fund it. Uh, so I just wanted to bring that up while while we're talking about the hygiene stability. I don't know how that would work with the Hope and Comfort program. I know that's more of a home-based program, like you take those products home with you, and I think they were more, the uh, Girl Scouts were hoping for more in-school mm -hmm. um, availability in the restroom. So I just wanted to bring that up. Maybe okay, sure. Follow up with some contact information. Sure, absolutely. Um, and then I wanted to ask about a couple things. One question I'm pretty sure I know the answer to, but the big brother, big sister, um, all of the bigs that they're reaching out to, they're all quarried, fingerprinted, background checked, all of that. So through. big brother, big sisters does vet. Um, you know, they have their, um, their system of checking. So, yes. Are they, but do they get quarry checked and fingerprinted as we would for if they were a volunteer in our schools? Um, yeah, sure. That's great. And that's for all the bigs? That would be for all the bigs. All the mentors, okay. They do all of that. Okay, that's yeah. fantastic. My, 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 uh, I have a ninth grader in this program, so I'm excited oh, to see great. how that's going to go. Great. Um, and, uh, and see how that... We built that into, our, into the contract, so it's a guarantee. Okay. It was they, It's their standard, but we wanted to see it in writing. So. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I think for sure. I mean, if we can't have parents go in and work a book fair, then we definitely need to make sure that... Correct. Those, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, who do is there a list somewhere uh, as to the members on the QPS coalition um, uh, coalition team? And I think there's probably another word sure. in that. Yeah, there is coalition I, for student mental health and well-being. Is there like a list of who the members on that coalition are? Yep. Or? Yep. I I have it. 
It's a, I have the email list, and then, um, yeah, I can share that with you. Okay. I just Or just in general, who's on that? Is it oh, sure. like SLT and then all these partners that you're working with? or So um, from Kim Conley okay. um, is on the team with me. Um, we just um, added the school adjustment counselors from each high school. Um, there's Manit. There's um, Big Brother, Big Sister, the Quarry. Quarry just um, got licensed to be a mental health provider, and they are having, I should have put this in my report, um, but this is really new, that we have clinicians from Quarry, um, one at Atlantic and one at North Quincy High School. They haven't started yet, but um, they're going to be working with our kids too, and they're Mandarin and Cantonese-speaking clinicians. Yeah, I can't even believe how much, how rich this community is, um, you know, with the, with the partners. Um, so there's Walker, um, Aspire, Bay State Community Services, who's been, they have been fantastic. They're, they're helping us with um, uh, the logic model or the evaluation for the behavioral health navigator. They're also um, providing the vaping cessation professional development. So like every time we go to a meeting, they're like, oh, we can do this. We can, you know, um, so Bay State's really fantastic. Um, Maria Drost just joined us, um, and we're excited to have that counseling. They do um, really low-fee um, counseling or free counseling for families in need. Um, oh, I know I'm forget- I, I feel terrible if I forget somebody. I know I can no, definitely send great. you a list. I just, just in a sense of who yeah. was. I didn't know if, like, the family liaisons were on there as well or how, how kind of how deep we went into it. So it's more the partners and a couple – um, SL, yourself and, and Kim Conley, just kind of coordinating all the programs that were yeah. being offered. That that's great because yep. it seems like there's a lot to juggle. So yeah. getting everyone together on that is yep. kind of, is really great. Uh, and knowing what everyone else is doing, so yeah. to not have the overlap is really great too. Um, the Sandy Hook, uh, as Mrs. Lebo said, fantastic. Uh, looked like a fantastic program um, and much needed, especially you know middle school. You know, just saying hello, starting with a hello, that's, you know, mm. huge. So I think everyone can benefit from that. Um, and my last question on the um, the McKinney-Vento, um, there were, did we have any, uh, in the stats we have here, and maybe these aren't uh, new enough stats, but would they include any families that uh, were displaced that were staying at the Wallace and T, or um, did it include any of those students? Did they ever end up entering into QPS for us, or...? <laughs> well, I know that um, Laura and the Homeless Liaison and I, you know, well, Laura really and the Homeless Liaison have been kind of um, working with those referrals as the ass- Assistant Superintendent Perkins has been too. Um, that That's a very confusing thing right now. Um, we were given a number of students to register and then they left. So... Um, so no, we don't have anybody, you know, from like the ENC shelter um, registered in our schools. I don't believe two. I'm sorry, two two students. Yeah. Last school year, we had no no students ever registered. In the last two weeks, we had nine students register, and seven students have moved have moved on. So they only went to school for a few days, and then they were moved. And so Le- Leslie Bridson reached out to the city that they're moving to because we did um, we did records. get you know have some testing done and we have records for them now that we can share with their new school. But we do have two students currently. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Being the vice chair, I don't get to ask any questions because everyone asks them all. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say. I don't envy you for the work that you do because of its complexity, but I'm grateful for the work that you do because oh, of its thank complexity. Thank you so much. I mean, it's, you know, overwhelming work and all the things that we see that are happening in this country in schools and the violence and all that is, is you know, disheartening. But I think that, um, you know, we as a school committee pushed to have the security audits done on the building. Um, and we, you know, look forward to make, seeing what the assessments are as far as the, um, the, the buildings themselves and the protocols that they're effective and they're, and they're, you know, giving us what we need. But to your point, um, it has to go hand in hand with 
yeah. you know, the mental health of our students. And I think the one of the biggest things I've been doing a lot of reading on some of the um, in, uh, of the um, the Atlanta and some of the school shootings mm -hmm. and things that have happened in the past. And um, you know, see something, say something. I talked to the superintendent one day about this, and um, I think we really have to let kids know that. You know, please, if if there's anything you know that you feel like is uncomfortable that you're hearing amongst your peers, we need you to say something. And if it's nothing, great. But mm -hmm. you know, that's how kids get help, and you know, we need to do that. And I hope that, and I think, from what you're saying, that we do do that. But I think that has to be reinforced throughout the year, yeah. honestly. And then the other piece, um, and to, uh, on that, um, do we? And I know it's hard when we reach out to parents and families because they don't always see what we're sending them or really pay attention to some of the messaging that we send them. But um, that's also important for families too because some of the things that I have read also um, points to other families of kids that appears, you know, that they may have seen something that didn't seem right and, you know, don't really say anything and that might help, you know, future um, issues from happening, you know. So yeah. I don't know if we, if we communicate with families or parents um, on that that side of the table but yeah I mean I I think you know we haven't done Sandy Hook before and I do but I do think it's going to teach us all how to you know kind of contend with these issues how to stay connected how to trust each other and I do think parents are an important part of that if we get concerned you know when we have to you know, um, you for our child for to the crisis center now that we have this clinician she can do the crisis eval right there Mm -hmm. And so for families not to have to go to an emergency room to get a crisis eval um, is huge. And so I think that builds trust. Mm -hmm. um, so if a student needs like a hospital level of care, the, the clinician can refer that child through that assessment right there. Mm -hmm. So to have someone that can do like an assessment, you know, a mental health assessment, you know, connected to Aspire is huge. And working um, with families. And working with families yeah. and building that trust. Yeah. Um, and I just think that, you know, this the re the resources that we have, we you know, like with the Behavioral Health Navigator, we're going to have to do outreach to parents so they know, you know, that we have these services and this person's going to help them. Mm -hmm. And that person that we're looking to hire speaks Portuguese. So, um, you know, that's, that's great. That's like another barrier removed. Right. So the more kids and families that are connected and the more barriers that we remove, and we have the family liaisons. That's why I said we're perfectly poised to remove a lot of barriers because those fabulous family liaisons can help with, the, you know, with other language and communication. Yeah. They, they know these families. Mm -hmm. Like, so if they, people need help, we're going to get them help. Right. And I think that's a huge part for safety for everybody. So let me ask you the the navigator. Um, it's it's a system, right? It's a, like a is a software that has all the resources on it's it. It's a person. Okay, because I was going to say like yeah. there is someone who helps them with all those pieces of the puzzle. To take yep. away the intimidation and the and identify what they need. Yeah. Um, thank you, because I really do feel we need to make sure that people, like you said, I think it's a trust issue that you can come to us. We'll you know you can trust us. We're not going to throw anyone under the bus or you know, any kids, you know, highlight them for coming to us and helping, you know, with messaging around someone who maybe is struggling. And um, the Hope and Comfort, I love that. It's a mm -hmm. great program, and I would love to volunteer if there's ever oh, an opportunity yeah. where they're putting together. Maybe we Absolutely. come as a school committee and we can come and do a, you yeah. know, call us, let us know when yeah. you're doing that. And the third thing is the um, Big Brother um, I did see a lot of outreach, and I actually, I had reposted some things, and people private messaged me, a couple of people that I think um, signed up to volunteer. So if you have that again, and, and maybe on the social media, if they can share sure. it again, and then we can share it again and try it, because you need another maybe 30 people or so to, yeah. to meet the kids that you have, um, that would be great. Awesome. So thank, thank you. you. Yep. Sorry. On the, um, the Sandy Hook Promise Initiative, um, you had said that it was a free grant that we um, were paying for that through the Attorney General's office? Um, the Attorney what, General that? just sent out information about it, so I signed up to learn about it, and they just you just had to sign up, and um, they come in person 
They do assembly style kind of trainings for everybody in the building. So is this for only one year? Is it next year also? Forward? It's for next year as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, just had one more um, thought. Mrs. Cahill, when you were speaking about this say something um, portion of the Sandy Hook promise, um, what I was suggesting back in the superintendent's report about having a safety kind of meeting with Mr. Drakeo here, um, I think it's all related, right? I think if, you know, putting all these parts together, it's very related to, you know, making sure we're noticing if someone's having a problem or making sure that they're feeling welcome mm -hmm. and just no noticing if something's off. Um, having parents feel trust if they see something, uh, it all works together. So if, if we're bringing everyone into the fold and saying as much as we can in open session, and again, I agree, some specifics in executive session, but if we're being open about everyone knows, you know, the trainings that are going on and what we're doing. So maybe that meeting that I was suggesting could be a little bit bigger where uh, the mayor had suggested maybe the, um, the police chief and the fire chief, maybe also we can mm -hmm. go over a little bit more about the Sandy Hook promise there and just kind of figure out maybe maybe it's a bigger um, thing I'm asking for on an agenda where we just kind of talk about safety uh, at that meeting and kind of how we're addressing it in multiple mm -hmm. ways so that parents can understand what we're doing. Um, staff and teachers, you know, if they don't understand everything that we're offering together, we just kind of have that meeting in one place where we're talking about it. I don't. Does that make sense to maybe do and something like that? In a, yeah, maybe so we could do like a bigger, our, our meeting. that could be a presentation from, you know, during the facility. Yeah, maybe future. something bigger like that. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, just to be appreciate it. Mrs. Liebel. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, Mara, is this something we should have a parent academy about? I mean, this is a lot of stuff in our schools, and maybe we should just have a parent academy, let people know the kind of supports that there are, too. Sure, um, yeah. I think that's one of the greatest things that we do. We do a lot of great things, but I do think the parent academies are are pretty awesome um, just to make sure that, that there's that transparency for people who would like to see it too. Mm -hmm. So I, I hate to have you make another presentation, but it might be nice to do that for the parents at some point in time. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No. I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, motion to approve, second by Mrs. Lebo. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda, we have workshop meet. No. Okay. Turn the page. Um, yeah. I turned the page too early. Um, health service program improvement plan, Mrs. Hero. Hi. 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 Good evening. Mayor, Superintendent, and members of the school committee, thank you for having me. I don't know if you can, is this picking up? I think you're on. I have them both on. Try okay. Can you hear it? Can you hear it a little closer? Yeah. Okay. I would like to take this time to review the health services team goals from the 23-24 school year and to share the 24-25 team goals with you. Our nursing team worked to educate staff, students, and families in the prevention of infectious diseases with main, main focus on strep throat, conjunctivitis, influenza, and the ever-present COVID. Um, <laughs> newsletters were sent home, bulletin boards were utilized to provide information. Nurses taught students on an individual basis when the students visited the health office. And there were 105,928 health office visits last school year. And that's a lot of teaching. <laughs> Um, so we recognize that one of the most important things a school nurse can do is to increase school attendance rates by using their skilled nursing assessments to keep students in school when they're deemed healthy enough to stay in school. Our professional development meetings focused on enhancing our nursing assessment skills regarding ear, nose, throat issues, seizures, and orthopedic injuries. We also attended a class to update our medical knowledge regarding the etiology assessment and treatment of life-threatening food allergies. As we enter the 24-25 school year, one of our goals, as listed on page nine in the PIP, is to help decrease chronic absenteeism by educating our community about infectious diseases. So obviously we're continuing with that. Um, we will be focusing this year on measles, 
staphylococcus infections, and all respiratory viruses. Um, our emphasis will be on recognizing and reporting the illness symptoms, proper hand washing, and immunizations. So some of the initiatives will include a staff training in the first week of school, and this includes infectious disease training as well as EpiPen, asthma, diabetes, those type of things. Um, we have sent home a s'more newsletter to all parents and guardians in the first week of school. It's called the Guidelines and Information for a um, Healthy School Year. Nurses track students who are diagnosed with any infectious illnesses using our SNAP electronic health record. Bulletin boards are designed with colorful messages reinforcing important infection prevention health measures. Um, we will communicate with Quincy Health Department nurses for any infectious illnesses that we need to reach out for help with. Um, individualized health teaching is provided to students, their family, and staff. So this year during our per professional development, we will focus on another one of our goals, which is listed on page 10. Um, and it is to continue to enhance our nursing assessment skills. We will have presentations from Boston Children's Hospital for cardiac and respiratory assessments. And in addition, the nurses will receive a BLS recertification training using the American Heart Association guidelines. We have added a new initiative, which is listed on page 11. And in partnership with Manic Community Health Center, King Optical, and the Lions Club of Quincy, um, at the end of last school year, we did like a, a mini pilot type program. And any students who had failed their vision screening through the year had not had the opportunity to go for an exam, um, were able to sign up for a comprehensive eye exam at Manit Health Center. King Optical was available with um, frames if kids needed to pick them out. Lions Club was there um, for financial assistance if there were people who needed financial assistance. Uh, Dr. Jeannie Hopkins and Dr. Ben Strake at Manit uh, hosted a one-day event where a student referred by our nurses from Montclair, Parker, Atlantic, and North Quincy High Schools could register for the eye exam. We focused on kind of a walking distance around North Quincy Manit because that's where it's located. Um, so we had, let's see, if the students were determined they needed these glasses, they could pick them up when they came in at Manit or they could be sent to the school nurse at the student's building. Uh, we had, let's see, we had 10 students take advantage of this program last year. Seven of them were determined to need glasses and all seven of them got their glasses. Um, so we're hoping to increase this program this year and we're gonna continue to partner with Manit, King Optical and the Lions Club. So sometime in November, we will have another day of vision at Manit. We will focus on kids at the end of last school year who hadn't passed their screening um, because we haven't quite screened everybody yet. And so we, and we're hoping to repeat it in the spring. Um, the Health Nutrition and Wellness Advisory Council meets four times a year. Our main goal is to promote wellness during the school year. The Advisory Council also provides guidance and support to individual school wellness teams, as well as reviewing our wellness and concussion policies on a yearly basis. Mass Healthy Smiles, which is our dental program initiative, will be coming to our schools again this year to provide cleanings, sealants, and fluoride treatments to our students. If students require treatment beyond this, then the hygienist will refer out the students and connect them with a local dentist um, for ongoing dental care. There were 592 students that were treated by the hygienist last year. All of the students received at least one cleaning and one fluoride treatment. 70% received a second cleaning and 63% had a fluoride treatment, um, a second fluoride treatment. So that's dependent on their age and what's needed for their teeth. Um, so there were 832 dental sealants applied. So that's for, like per tooth, I guess. Um, according to Mass Healthy Smiles, we had a far higher participation rate than they typically see in most school districts. Um, you should have a copy um, with the PIP there that they had provided that uh, presentation, which was very nice. Um, 
So our dental hygienist is Jackie Ventura, and I work really closely with her, and we're excited to do this again this year. Forms already went home to parents. They're in the hands of the hygienist now, being reviewed. We're hoping to get started within the next few weeks in October with the first exams. Um, so the appendix, starting on page 16, includes a link and a couple examples of the PowerPoint presentation that we offer to staff, the Healthy Guidelines S'more newsletter link for parents that nurses use towards meeting their health services goals. <clears throat> the data from the 2023-24 end of year report on page 17 in the appendix reflects how much work it takes our nurses to keep our community safe and healthy. As I had said before, there were 105,928 student encounters, which are visits, up from 91,088 in the year before and 75,870 in 21-22. Of these, 100,689 students were returned to class after a visit to the health office. This is approximately a 95.1% return to class rate, and this has increased. It was 93.3% the year before and 90.2% in 21-22. So this definitely demonstrates the impact that our school nurses have on keeping students in school. Um, they cared for 3,708 students with specialized health care needs, which is an increase of 428 students. There were 37 reported diagnosed head injuries, which occurred during school sports in or in school activities, and 39 that occurred during other activities outside of school, so somewhere in the home. Um, school nurses work closely with students who have been diagnosed with a concussion. Doesn't matter if it was in school or out of school, we're still working with them. They collaborate with the student, parents, primary care providers, and school staff to monitor the medical management of the student and work with the school staff to adjust their academic schedules when necessary. There were 11,968 scheduled doses of prescription medication administered, which is an increase of 1,128 doses. 7,928 additional medication doses were administered, administered per the as-needed prescriptions, things like Tylenol, Motrin, Tums, those type of things. This shows an increase of 3,649 from last year when there was a shortage of our liquid Tylenol. Um, so it should be noted also that we do not, as a first-line treatment, give these medications. We are committed to teaching students how to manage their discomfort with other means first before giving medication. Examples are like ice, heat, rest, um, relaxation techniques, meditation. Uh, we don't try to just jump, give you a pill, and go to class. Um, there were 20,563 documented nursing communications to a parent or guardian regarding student health issues. 9,591 documented nursing communication with school staff and 911 documented communication with community agencies. So that could be um, the health department or individualized doctors. The seven QPS staff nurses who are certified CPR instructors continue to offer CPR AED classes to our staff throughout the school year. We had 89 staff members that were CPR AED certified last year. And with the help of Brewster Ambulance, the Matter of Heart Initiative, which will continue this year again, um, it resulted in all the eighth grade students learning hands-only CPR with 96 who completed the full certification class that was offered. Of that 96, there it's a mix of parents and students. Um, and this initiative, as I said, will continue. So as you can see, our nurses work diligently to provide quality nursing care to our community and we are committed to keeping healthy children in school. Thank you for your time and support. Are there any questions? Thank you. Um, not just for this, but for all you and your and all the nurses do. I mean, this is amazing. Um, the number of visits, the, um, just incredible work. Um, a couple of things I had a question on. Um, 
this, uh, the thing that stuck out to me a little bit was um, the, the 89 staff members certified in CPR. Is that just nursing staff? No. So that's, that's staff? That's all, all staff. Paras, okay. teachers, whoever wants to sign up. We offer four classes throughout the year. Okay. Uh, we advertise it out, whoever wants to sign up. Okay. Um, do you, and I'm just noticing that last year it was almost double that. Is there, it was. Do you think that I think there was a drop off on keeping track. There's somebody else who keeps track, keeps those CPR records for me. And um, all that was provided to me was one small subset. So I'm sure there were more, but that's all I could capture. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's, um, yeah, that's, that's great. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, if it's not recorded, you know, properly, but as long as everyone, as long as you're comfortable with the amount of people mm -hmm. in each building that, that are CPR certified, that's yeah. great. And we also, it's a two-year cycle, so they're certified for two years. Yep. So sometimes we do see that. Gotcha. Up and down. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, and just, you know, from, from dental to vision, just the amount of partners that you're bringing into the fold as well. I mean, it's great. I thank the partners as well, but I know it's a, I mean, you're getting those partners. You're reaching mm -hmm. out and finding those. I'm just wondering if, um, can you email this to us? It's just, it's hard to read. Like, I was curious, you know, what services they provided yeah, it didn't, on that. It didn't, it didn't is that the dental photo, one? Yeah. It yeah. Didn't photocopy well on just, I, I would just be curious as to what um, the services were that were provided in this yeah, chart. Yeah, I think the so. breakdown is like sealants, fluid, uh, fluoride, yeah. um, cleanings. But yeah, yeah, yeah we can just, email. We that would be great. Can do Thank that. you. But mm -hmm. um, I'm just so appreciative of um, all the partnerships you're able to cultivate and, and all the services you're able to offer the students. So thank you to you and your staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is amazing. Your nurses are amazing. You guys do a wonderful job. Thank you so much. Um, just one question. Um, do the nurses get any training on assisting children with hearing aids? Until this time, no. Other than our ENT assessments, you know, which is outside of the scope, uh, hearing aids generally are outside the scope of a nurse as far as, like, how they work using them. But it's not that difficult. You know, if we had someone that wanted to do a training, that would be great. Yeah. We would do it. But the nurses are... Pretty much, if they're involved, it's mainly battery replacement. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll follow up with you on that. Sure. Thank you. The data on page 17 is unbelievable. It really is unbelievable. Yeah. What a group. Uh, and now with the Learning Center opening, I'm sure you've increased your staffing. And yes. uh, we'll be seeing bigger numbers, I'm more sure. impressive numbers. I love the dental program. When you look at those numbers of kids who've been served, um, what a huge thing that is for somebody to, you know, yeah. we talk about mental health, but if somebody's got a toothache yeah. for some reason, some other physical reason that they can't come to school, mm -hmm. it's, it's huge. It really is huge. I went to visit one of the, pro you know, while they were doing one of the programs and we had a student who was, you know, had a tooth abscess and they immediately stopped what they were doing, went and called the parent, went and called the dentist, got the child an appointment that day and just, it lined up so beautifully and now that kid felt better and could come to school and learn. And it just, I, I can't say enough about the program. It's really great. It's wonderful. It really is wonderful. Thank all the nurses for the work they do and for your leadership. Um, it's terrific. Terrific Thank program. You. Yeah, I'm just echoing everything. I love the format of the PIP. I love the data. I love how you correlated last year and this year and the contextual explanation that you gave around some of the complicated issues. And it's Mrs. Perdio said the partnerships as well mm -hmm. that you're doing. And it's making a meaningful difference in so many families in, in this city. It's just terrific. So I know it's a lot of work. Thank you yep, for all you thank do. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation, as usual. Um, I spoke to you about this last year, and you said something to me that kind of took me aback. I asked you about the life back um, mm -hmm. system and mm -hmm. why it's not used or why we don't have it. And you told me something that really surprised me. Could you review that? Sure. For everybody to hear it? Sure. Because we so, have a lot of <clears throat> younger kids now, mm -hmm. pre-K, um, who are more likely to have a situation where they're choking on something. Correct. So nurses work under a licensure, and we have to follow the laws of the licensure. The Life Vac is not quite FDA approved. So until it becomes FDA approved, we cannot 
utilize that tool um, legally using under our nursing license. So the FDA is something that we have to wait on before we can use a life vac. Um, the evidence-based procedure that we use is what formerly was known as Heimlich, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, is the abdominal thrust. Uh, should the FDA come along and approve it, we are certainly willing to look into having that in the schools. Um, but as of right now, it's not legal for us to use it. As I said last year to you, I was surprised mm -hmm. that the FDA has not approved it. I mean, I don't understand why it wouldn't be. I'm not a medical doctor. Yeah, and um, my cousin is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Good answer. Um, thank you so much. And you know, I say this all the time um, when I'm out and about and talking to people. Um, we have an amazing system. We really do. And and you know, when you come up and present, and you show the extra work that you do to bring things to partners to the table, to give our kids what they need so that they can learn. In, you know, without a toothache, so that they can have the home comfort materials, so they feel good mm -hmm. about coming to school. Um, and those seem like simple things, but they're really huge. They're important, and but all of it together. And and you know, we really need to be proud of Quincy Public Schools for everything that comes to the table here. And our kids are really lucky. So thank you, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Um, can we have? Oh, we need a motion to approve. Um, and second by Mrs. Lebo. Roll call vote, please. All in favor? All in favor? Aye. 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 I knew that. Okay. Um, next on the agenda, we have um, the school improvement plan template by Ms. Dr. Perkins. Thank you. Good evening. And Mr. Marani. Yes, Sorry. I'm joined here by right? not on the list. I'm gonna Mr. Marani. Uh, and so we wanted to just take a minute to present to you um, the, the school improvement plan template. We did this last year around this time, and we thought it was actually really effective to get your feedback prior to the principals doing their presentations and developing their plans. And so we thought that we would bring that to you again and again, you know, ask you for your feedback and if you want to see any changes um, so that we can make sure that we incorporate those into the, the school improvement plan template. So just to... Um, refresh your memories, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what are the required elements of the school improvement plan, um, what the most recent format was, so based on the changes that you suggested last year, what the, the format is that we're currently working from, um, any notable changes that we want to make sure uh, we present to you, um, and then SIP presentation information. So some of the required elements and where they show up in our school improvement plan. So the first required element from the Department of Education is an assessment <laughs> of the impact of class size on student performance, student to teacher ratios, and ratios of students to other supportive adults and resources. And so we do include that in, um, you'll find that in our current template under the demographics section, we have school uh, class sizes, and we also have include staffing within the appendix. Um, in addition, number two is a scheduled plan for reducing class size <laughs> if deemed necessary. This is not typically uh, an area of concern in Quincy. However, if it is an area of concern, principals will absolutely address it within their school improvement plan. We also monitor class sizes as do you throughout the course of the school year. Um, the prof uh, number three is professional development for school staff and allocation of any funds. And so where that is in the school improvement plan is under uh, section B, which is that we have actually included a professional development plan in there. Um, and typically the district is the one that funds the professional development. Uh, so number four is enhancement of parent parental involvement in the life of the school. And we did add... Um, somewhat recently a family engagement and communication section and I think the communication section was actually new based on some feedback that you all had provided to us last year. Um, school safety and discipline that is under the SSDR data in it in our demographic section and also it also is included within the appendix from the vocal survey results that we include there. 
Um, just continuing on with some of the required elements. So as number six is an establishment of a school environment characterized by tolerance and respect for all groups. So the principals absolutely talk about this and how they address this within their principal's message, within the reflection when they analyze their vocal data, um, and they look at the spring vocal data within the appendix. Item seven is extracurricular activities. We have this. We actually have a chart that includes all of the extended day activities, and that's in improvement plan section C. Means for meeting within the regular education programs at the school, um, meeting the needs of diverse learning needs of as many children as possible, including children with special education needs currently assigned to separate programs. And again, they do reflect on all of this within the principal's path. Uh, under the data reflection, the goals reflection, the vocal reflection. Um, it's also weaved in within their school improvement plan goals, their statements, and their action steps. In particular, if they have, you know, substantially separate programs or other programs in their building, you know, those, those teachers and those programs participate in the development of the school improvement plan goals, just like every other teacher in the building. Um, and number nine, any further subjects of principal in consultation with the school council shall consider appropriate. And so some of the things that we include in our school improvement plan are the school demographics, uh, facilities information, um, budget, any budget that they may have, um, and uh, the appendix, uh, which also, in the, you know, is in particular over the course of the last few years, you know, we have encouraged them to include anything that they feel like they want you to see and is, you know, relevant to their school culture and climate. Every school is different, and we want to make sure that they feel that they can highlight that, especially in the time that they have to present to you and to their school communities. So just to talk about the most recent format, so last year we did add some things, and uh, Mr. Morani will go into that in a little bit more detail. But uh, has been here for a while. They, the principals typically do a, a message at the beginning and a reflection. Some principals do three different sections. Some principals do it all in one section. We have really steered away from, you know, micromanaging what that looks like. And so it's up to them how they want to present that information to you. What we do ask them to do is make sure that they have a reflection on their data that they have a reflection on their goals and that they have a reflection on the, the vocal um, survey. How they incorporate that into their message is their call. Um, so the school improvement plan, we all, again, we've really tried to push them to develop individual goal statements that are reflective of their school and their school needs. Um, so they work with their staff on that. Uh, I think they really, you know, did a nice job of that last year. It was hard for them to separate from the template that we had, you know, traditionally provided them, but they did it. And we actually had a really nice meeting today with the middle school principals to review the data. We reviewed district data and we reviewed their data in preparation for our presentation to the community on data and then also their presentations and the development of the school improvement plans. And we spent a long time talking about goals and action steps and you know what those could look like. And, um, and so I, I think that they enjoyed it and we enjoyed it as well, just having that time today. Um, they also include, their, as I mentioned, a professional development plan. They do have a section on extended day offerings and family engagement and communication. And then, as I just talked about, the school demographics, the facilities, and the budget. And then before I turn it over to Mr. Morani, just to remind you what's um, in the appendix. So we have, they include, we have all of the reports, the spring 2024 MCAS data will be included in there. Oft, sometimes principals want to include their own charts that they've done with their staff, and that's fine as well. We do include the charts um, on uh, their information on the MAP RIT scores from last year, from 23-24. I do want to just mention, since it is in this appendix, that one of the things that we are considering that you should be aware of, and we can discuss further at a later meeting, um, eighth grade, I think it came up last year, has an excessive amount of testing. Uh, they have, um, you know, science, they have uh, social studies, they have math, they have ELA, and they also have the, the map at the end of the school year. We do not administer the map in ninth grade. 
Um, so it is something that we are recommending that we could consider the spring assessment only, potentially not assessing the eighth graders in the spring. So we wanted to put that out, out to you all. It's something that we are considering because it's not, it's used for the, um, the map. Yeah, the map. Um, so we're, we're considering because we're going to have a full social studies assessment as well. And it is a lot of testing for those eighth graders. It pretty much will mean the entire spring they're going to be testing. And so um, we are strongly recommending that we administer the map in, for, to the eighth grade in the, in the fall and in the winter and that we let go of the eighth grade spring map because that's three, that's three assessments. They do reading, math, and science in eighth grade. Um, it's a lot. So it's something that we could give on you know, because we can't give on the MCAS. So, and if you participate, and if the kids have to take access, you're talking even more. So, um, so anyway, so we just wanted to, where we had this in the appendix tonight, we can talk more about it when we do our uh, district data presentation, but it's something for you to consider and think about. And certainly, you know, you can share your opinions with us. Um, Did you discuss this with the principals too when yes. you met with the principals? Yep, they they agree. I'm I can sure. tell you they 100% agree. Sure they agree. Yeah, yep. So, um, and so uh, they also we also include the 2024 accountability information. We include the 2024 um, vocal data. We added this last year. I think this was a, a suggestion from the committee to add a completed section of action steps. So. That will also um, be in the appendix. We have the staffing, I think, adding the support services, you know, staffing around support services and numbers was another um, request from the committee. And then uh, we have the school council members, which, you know, we will have signed. And, you know, I think that that was something that the committee felt really strongly about. Um, and then also the other thing that we do, we did last year, and we will do it again this year, is that we ask the principals to please present to their school communities prior to their presentation to you and to make sure that they are collecting and adding any any relevant feedback to the school improvement plans based on that feedback. So they do it with their school council, but last year we asked them to get to their, you know, basically their PTOs or their school communities somehow, some way, and do it for them prior to them bringing it to you. So that, that any feedback that they collect from that should already be incorporated into the school improvement plan. So we will do that again this year. I think that came from you all. And so we will um, do that again. And I think it was really successful and it worked out well. So we'll just, we will make sure that we do that for this year as well. And I'll turn it over to Ms. Marani. Thank you, Dr. Perkins. Good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so. After going over the format that we used last year, uh, I wanted to go through just a couple of the changes we made last year as a result of your feedback. And so it is our intention to move forward with these changes once again. So when I say changes, they're changes uh, that we implemented last year, and we would like to continue with those changes this year, but uh, you know, pending your feedback after this presentation. So uh, one of the, the key notable changes there was just the overall process in which uh, principals work with their teams to develop their school-based SMART goals. And so we really wanted to emphasize and empower principals to feel comfortable uh, being individualized in the goals that they develop at their school based on their school's unique needs. Uh, so the ways we did that were focusing three part, one on assessments, so opening up the typical assessments from MCAS and MAP, but also incorporating for principals that felt appropriate access, MCLAS and Dibbles, along with vocal survey data. Um, it's certainly not limited to this list, but these are just you know, assessments that we use across the district that we say, you know, feel free. If this makes sense for you, certainly feel free and comfortable to incorporate it into your uh, SMART goal. Uh, additionally, just the metrics. So, you know, in past practice, a lot of times you'd seen the same set of metrics across every school. And so we just wanted principals and their teams to feel comfortable picking their metrics based on the needs of their students. Um, and then, of course, making sure that it can be as targeted as they need it to be. And so the target aspect is not just um, 
grade levels and subgroups, but it's also within domains and standards. So it might be different domains across different grade levels. It might be different subgroups across the same set of standards. Uh, and that could vary school to school. I do have some examples throughout this presentation of just kind of showing you some highlights of what we saw last year to show you the difference in the goals. So with those images there, you'll see on the left, that's actually one, uh, one goal. So that's an ELA goal. Uh, looks a little bit different than what we're typically used to. That's because it's a multi-part goal. So if you look, this is an ELA goal that first emphasizes uh, grades three through five. They're focusing in on essay, uh, the essay domain, and they're focusing from a metric standpoint on the average percent correct. So they're looking to, I believe uh, they were looking, this school was looking for a 2% point increase across those numbers that you see there within those essay categories across grades three through five. And then they went into MAP, which again, that's a pretty traditional test that we've used many times in the past. But what's interesting about this sample is you see the metric has shifted. So rather than just focusing exclusively on the RIT change year to year, they actually focus on the percentage of students that met their projected target. So each student in our MAP database gets assigned a projected target based on how they perform in previous tests. So what this school is looking at is, okay, how many of these students are hitting those projected targets and what can we do to increase that number? So again, just similar test or similar assessment, just looking at it a little bit differently uh, to advocate for their students and their needs. Um, Again, so if you look top right, another ELA goal, but I just want to emphasize the fact that now you incorporate the Dibbles or the M-Class assessment in there, and it's across K-5. So that's another benefit of opening up the possible assessments they could look at, is we're not just uh, stuck within 2 through 5, which is traditionally uh, what we can look at when we're looking at MAP, obviously 3 through 5, and for middle school beyond 5. Um, when looking at MCAS. So by bringing Dibbles, uh, really MCAS, it's Dibbles kind of as a former name, but MCAS, um, by bringing that into that, that opens up the school to be able to establish a metric for students down to uh, kindergarten. So it's a good opportunity. Um, and again, just another highlight there, uh, and these are all separate schools, you'll see a three-part goal there across K-5. So a lot of unique goals um, across the board. Another notable change uh, was the format in which action steps um, were recorded. So it may seem basic at first glance. So on the far right, we just simply added a column where principals could add in whether or not that action step is revised from last year, continued on from uh, last year, or new. So a new action step. So that obviously helps from a communication standpoint as we read it. It allows us to see you know, what has changed, what hasn't. Uh, but I also want to point out it also prompts reflection in the action step development. So it does help, you know, teams of teachers. Let's say if you have a, you know, social or that's not a great example because we're talking MCAS. But let's say you're talking uh, a science team of teachers, a vertical team, and they're looking at their action steps. It's going to prompt them to say, what have we been doing? What else should we be trying? And just by putting that column in there, it does just kind of prompt that thought process and hopefully create some good conversation in that action step development among the teams at each school. So again, that's another notable change, just adding that status column there. And then the third notable change that's worth mentioning, um, as Dr. Perkins mentioned, in the appendix we added a completed action steps um, component to the appendix. So this was nice because in addition to being able to see what's revised, what's new, what's continued, it also allows us to see, well, what has been removed? What has been taken out from last year, from the previous year? Uh, one thing I want to emphasize, though, is just because it's removed doesn't mean it's not happening in the school. And that was one thing that principals were you know, questioning, right? And, and so we landed on kind of delineating it in two ways. So if it's completed, that either means it's discontinued. So an example of that, if you look in the, the right picture, the grade K4 work with literacy consultants, we no longer work with those consultants, so we wouldn't include that. That's a discontinued action step. It's just not the focus for that particular year. And then also you might see action steps where they're so regular, they're embedded in the day-to-day. -day. 
and they're no longer a part of, they're, they're not a new action step. They've been repeated year after year, and they're just embedded in the typical daily operations of that school. And so that's where discretion comes into play on the part of the principal and the team members coming up with the action steps. And so it just allows those teams to say, okay, these are still embedded in the day-to-day, -day, but they're kind of automatic at this point. Now what are the action steps that we really have to go out of our way to make sure we make happen you know, by the end of the year to support uh, students? And then lastly, just to give a quick overview of kind of how it all played out last year as far as the presentation piece, they started uh, in early December, so December 4th, 6th, and 11th. We had uh, six uh, schools each, so we started with North Quincy and then the remaining middle schools on the 4th. On the 6th, we had um, Quincy High School along with five other elementary schools and the remaining elementary schools on the 11th. These occurred uh, during all the teaching and learning subcommittee meetings, or they occurred during um, each a teaching and learning subcommittee meeting. Each presentation was an average of 17 to 18 minutes, including Q&A, so just, again, for planning purposes. And just as we look ahead, we just have to consider that now that RDLC is up and running, they're going to have to be a part of this process, too. Uh, so with that, you know, this is the direction we're looking to go with our school improvement plans. I know the principals are anxious to get started, uh, but we just wanted to give you all the opportunity to offer any feedback on the changes that we made last year and, and what we plan to do moving forward. Thank you. So first off, this is great. Um, we really want to see the individuality needs and strengths. That's like, I know from talking to my colleagues, that's like something that's very important to us. Um, so this is great. Um, so in saying that under number seven, um, the extracurricular activities, because they something I've pointed out several times is that the principals really need to like show us the full year. I've heard yeah. so many times that like they yep. didn't put stuff in because, well, we didn't have a date or we didn't know it was going to happen, but it's something that you do every year and it's something that's really positive in your school community. So let's put it in there. You know, like we want to see that, even though it's, it's something that's going to be at the end of the year and you're not really, it's something you do every year and in in the school community, you know, they love it. So put it in there. You know, we yeah. want to see that because yeah. that shows your individuality of your school. That's something that's really great about your school. So yep. put it in there. Yeah. Um, also, um, under the um, removed action steps, if you were saying that the principals were kind of con con uh, concerned about that, just a suggestion. Maybe I don't know if something you thought of before. Was just maybe putting like an asterisk down the bottom and letting them write the reason why. Mm -hmm. Maybe then that would make them feel a little bit more comfortable about having it be a removed action step. Just a suggestion in there. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. That's Thank all you. I have. But this is great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is this is great. I think it's going to be great. I agree. I love the individualized plan and I think they did a great job with that last year mm -hmm. though they they were worried. I'm wondering if um if that are we looking at the same timeline? It seemed like it was very late that we got these last year. I think the data came out a little bit later last year. Um, we do have the data now, and it was made official yesterday. So I'm not sure what the dates are yet for the teaching and learning, but their school improvement, um, their their A days are coming up. So we met with the middle school today because their A day is the 9th, yeah. I think, and the elementary, it might be October 23rd, I think. Okay. So um, we're meeting with the elementary school next week. So somebody might be ready earlier than, than the December. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, and, the, and the time was perfect. Really, the presentations were great, and we had all read everything before we got here, and the questions were great. So I think that time is perfect, and we can get that many in, in a meeting, which is mm -hmm. great. I have one question that um, the new accountability system. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to have to get some information on that at some point. Yeah, we're going to present on... Um, I think October 23rd to you all. Okay. So we have all the data. We've been pouring over it. Um, Mike and Bridget and Kim and Chris, uh, the, which is why we met with the principals and we're, we're meeting with them in separate kind of groups. So we have the elementary coming together next week. We did the middle school today and we'll be doing the high school principals after that uh, to do that, just that. So mm -hmm. we, um, we have been pouring over it. You know, I mean, I think I'm sure you saw the news across the state MCAS scores are not great. I think we reflect the state. 
um, you know, so, uh, but we'll, we'll be presenting you with an, an in-depth presentation what on the new the, accountability is going to look like. Yep, on the that's, 23rd. I'm and very cons confused, not concerned, but confused about what that's going to. Yeah, so we, we will present all of that to you and, um, you know, maybe we could make that the only presentation that night since it will be pretty substantial. Yeah. So. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I thought I, I was not here uh, on the committee during the uh, school improvement plans last year, but I did see them and I saw that they um, the, the format seemed a lot um, looser, which mm -hmm. I think allowed for the schools to kind of be a little more personal and unique, and that's what we want to see. We, it doesn't need to be a you know, cookie yep. cutter from one school to the next. It's just tell us about your school, gush about your school. We want to know about it. We want to know what's what's great, what's working really well, and what you need help with. So um, I think that the the looser, I want to say, looser might not be the right word, but format, a little more flexible might be um, better. And um, I'm excited that they'll be a little more comfortable with it this mm -hmm. year uh, and even go a little further with that. So definitely like just seeing what's unique about the schools and knowing that the goals don't have to be, you know, all of scores need to go up like that. Like you, okay. uh, Mr. Marani, like you were mentioning, you know, the ways you can take a goal and, and expand that. I think that's fantastic. You know, trying to meet the projected, how many students met their projected MAP score or, mm -hmm. or RIT score. I think that's fantastic. So um, I'm excited to see what those goals will look like given that flexibility. Um, I'd, love, I'd love to see a real emphasis on facility needs um, mm -hmm. and really just put it in there. Don't feel bad about you know, if you if if there's a need in your building, put it in there, and it will get to Paul Hines, and we'll we'll get it on the list. But it can't get on a list if they don't tell us. So, um, put everything in there, and not just facility needs, but school needs. You know, if you need books for your library, or you need whatever you need, things in your building, I would love to see that in there too. So, facility needs and school needs. Um, if that's something, just a suggestion to add, te technology needs, that type of stuff. Um, <laughs> that would be great to see in there. And then th thank you for uh, saying about bringing to PTOs first. And I, I, I agree with Mrs. Lebo, it felt a little late last year, but also I want to allow that time for the PTOs to be able to give feedback because mm -hmm. oftentimes, you know, PTOs already have their schedules made for their, their meeting dates and it's, you know, hard if, if it's done, you know, you want to get it to mm -hmm. the PTO and get that feedback because otherwise we're looking at a plan that, you know, the community might not be on board with. I'm mm -hmm. sure they would be, but in theory. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to see it after the PTOs have kind of, the parents have gotten to see it and comment on it as well. Um, and the last thing I want to say is yes, get rid of spring eighth grade <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> map tests. Absolutely. I mean, map tests really are to help the educator, from what I understand, to help the educator know what to work on next yes. with those students. Yeah. And it, we're really at the end of the year there. Mm -hmm. So, and like you say, they're not really using that. It doesn't really carry over to ninth grade. So um, if we can get rid of one, oh my God, it was a constant, having an eighth grader last year and having an eighth grader this year, it's constant testing. And it's just, my kids don't get bothered by the stress of it, but they don't do anything else in the, in the school other than just testing, testing, testing. And it's just too much. Um, so anything we can get rid of, thank you for being creative and trying to figure out something we could maybe get rid of. And I would be fully in support of that one. So thanks. Great, thank you. We gonna do that? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I, I thought I had two things. I have three things. Okay. Um, and two of my comments. Um, so this presentation was exactly what I was hoping for last year. This presentation was exactly what I was hoping for. So not only did you educate us and everybody watching at home and everything about all of the DESE requirements that have to go in the school improvement plan, but the discretion that the principals have and the changes that we made based on a conversation that we had last year. I love the, the blueprint. I w I'm looking now at SIPs mm -hmm. you know, th through a different lens, uh, understanding things a little bit better. And, and I, so I think there's value to a similar presentation at the beginning of the school year mm -hmm. before we get mm -hmm. the SIPs going forward. Mm -hmm. But exactly yeah. what, what I hope for. So um, good stuff. So um, the one specific uh, required component that we've talked about, I think, in, in different subcommittees was the school safety and discipline. Yep. And, and that's one of those things, and you can figure it out. But I still think there would be value to us looking at what the categories of discipline are sure. and knowing what the numbers are by each school 
And I'm not saying that we necessarily have that. You know, if you say for X, Y, Z reasons that we have to do that in executive session, then uh, I'm open to, to either way. But I just think that we need to see it on a school by school basis and understand what the categories are so that we can ask you mm -hmm. what those are. So uh, I don't think we ever got that information mm -hmm. last school year. So it would be useful to have that. And I'm not saying as, as part of the SIP presentation, but it would be useful to subsequently have that so that we had it as a discussion before this body. Sure. Is that fair? Okay. Yeah. And then the the last thing that I want to say, since we did the SIPs last time, mm -hmm. um, we had Mass Association of School Committees come in and tell us that we can no longer necessarily, you know, when, when you have a subcommittee, it's the subcommittee members are there unless we post it as a meeting of the whole. And so, um, you know, I, I'm somebody that enjoys sitting in on the SIPs, and I don't know if we have to have a discussion that, you know, do we do it as a committee of the whole, or is it is it posted as teaching and learning, but a committee of the whole as well? Um, because I, I wouldn't want to be sitting out in the audience if I'm not a member of that committee and hearing those presentations. I would welcome the opportunity. And, I, you know, I don't want to be the first to make an exception to the rule that we just passed. <laughs> they said we, we still have some committees. But this is one of those compelling things that I think has value across the system to all, all of the members of the school committee that we might want to voice. So that, I'm just weighing that that's more for this yeah. group. Well, I just, you know, the, the, the chair, um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm excellent. Um, I just want to say thank you for taking into consideration all the things that we had recommended last year. And I appreciate the um, the adding in the specialists and their caseloads yep. and, you know, for each school, because it gives us an indication if there's a need for more or if they're doing okay the mm -hmm. way they are. And, um, yeah, so thank you for that. And the, the thing about the um, embedded, um, mm -hmm. when a goal has been embedded, and I, I think Mrs. Hubley mentioned this, but... You maybe can put that in there, yeah. mm -hmm. like on the side that it's yeah. been embedded into the curriculum or into yeah, those, you definitely. know, and that's why it's been done. Yeah. So it's easy. That, yeah. that's an easy, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So thank you for for me. All set. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So next we are on the um, Emilio Della Chiesa ECC building. Uh, referral to facilities. So moved. Um, yep. Okay. So moved by Mrs. Hubley. And um, we're all set there. And then I can add that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Because okay. it's in the motion. It's just moved. In there just um, since that building is now empty since we brought all those kiddos over to the um, RDLC I think uh, just having a quick conversation about what the future of that building is and if we had any updates from um, either the superintendent or the mayor about that um, if we could just maybe put that on a you know upcoming um, facilities uh, subcommittee meeting I would appreciate that Mr. Shibley. You all set? Thanks. All right. Thank you. Um, the consent agenda can we have a Motion to approve a second. second. Um, any conversation on the um, con consent agenda? No. Nope. Nope. Roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Bagot, yes. Mrs. Cahill. Yes. Mr. Vatro, yes. Mrs. Hubert, yes. Mrs. Lebo, yes. Mrs. Carrier, yes. Thank you. Um, there is no additional business. Um, communications. We have upcoming school committee meetings, regular meetings on October 9th and the 23rd. Um, November 13th at 6.30 p.m. at Coddington Building. Workshop meeting is to be scheduled to review the school committee goals document. Um, reports of subcommittees, there are none. Executive session, there is none. And so we call the meeting to adjourn. Motion to adjourn, second by Mr. Bergoli. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.